Hello everyone. Today, today you get the spiffy me dressed up. I, uh, I had a lunch meeting and I came back and I figured I would stay well dressed for you guys. And today I wanted to make a video that, that kind of relates to that, to my meeting that I had because pretty much every time I go out and every time I talk to people, whether they be translators or non-translators, but especially non-translators, they always ask me the question. They always ask me, well, do you think now with Google Translate or whatever machine translation, you know, do you think that you'll be out of a job? Do you think, uh, you know, uh, how, how much of a half-life, you know, how, how many more years do you have as a translator, as a translation agency? Because sooner or later, they're going to perfect this technology. and There's no future for it. And, you know, I hear this with different variations. Most people just ask me. Some people say, well, do you know, there you have no future. So what are you going to do or stuff like that? Um, and so I wanted to make a video that because every time they ask me this, I kind of feel like I need a stock response and I wanted, you know, to print out a card where I can give the response or maybe I'll just direct them to this video. This video is my response to all that. And so here I wanted to go through it uh, briefly or not so briefly and show you what I think is happening and the reasons why. Um, by the way, I already did a video that talks a bit about machine translation, uh, but it's it sort of just more... I kind of go through Google Translate and show you some of the funny things you can do or some of the mistakes it makes and uh, and uh, and why that happens. And so I'll link to that video in the description below. But here I just wanted to talk more about uh, about machine translation per se and about the effect this will have on translators, on translation agencies in the coming years. And, uh, and anyway, my take on all that. So will machine translation take over our jobs and will we become irrelevant because of it? Um, the short answer is no. So if that's enough for you, then that's enough for you and you can uh, watch another video. But um, if, if uh, you want to know why I feel this way, uh, then let me get into it a bit more. So let me start off with, first of all, if you enter something into, actually, let me start off with Google. Um, when I say machine translate, I mean stuff like Google Translate or Bing Translate. Now, there are a bunch of different variations of this and, um, and a bunch of different ones that then might be a bit more specialized in certain languages or in certain fields or stuff like that. Like you'll find ones that are specialized, yeah, for certain languages and maybe only scan like financial documents to see what's been translated in which way or maybe only official ones or ones that have been issued by governments or stuff like that. And, um, and these are actually used uh, quite often. I'll get into that a bit later. Um, but uh, Usually when people talk about this stuff, they mean Google Translate. They mean these universal ones. Google Translate, Bing Translate, there's Sistran. Um, do they still have the Babelfish thing? I don't even, I don't know. Anyway, you know, all the all these other ones and th that's what they mean. So that's the, you know, main thing I'm going to be addressing here. So first of all, you enter something into say Google Translate and you write something like I am going to the store. Chances are whatever language you put in, it'll translate it correctly. That's a simple enough sentence it stands by itself and you know that's all you need to worry about so that's fine the problems start to come usually you notice the problems right away uh unless it's some issue about a complicated sentence you 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 usually notice it right away with metaphors similes innuendos euphemisms stuff like that and and definitely humor humor is the worst usually and so here i'm talking about stuff like raining cats and dogs uh i have an axe to grind um waiting for the other shoe to drop, I have skeletons in the closet, stuff like that. These are all expressions, euphemisms, if you will, that um, native speakers understand perfectly. They have no problem with it. And when you use it with a native speaker or even not a native speaker, they know what you're talking about. They can make a judgment call. They know the gist of it and you can go on. However, these machine translations, they work on an algorithm. So many times these things are not very easy. And so what do you have? You'd say, I have an axe to grind or uh, it's raining cats and dogs or I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. You put this and translate it into another language. If you put it by itself, it might actually get the, uh, the expression correct because it scours all past translations and finds ones that are similar. And lo and behold, it finds the right one. Unfortunately, we usually don't use it this way. We often don't use it this way. In fact, for many of these, the majority of the times we don't use them this way. We don't use them exactly like I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop or while waiting for the other shoe to drop. It'll be something like, you know, someone says something, you'll be like, and the other shoe drops or, you know, some variation thereof. 
Um, and it'll be something like, uh, you see this a lot with fiction, you see this a lot with newspaper headlines and with people talking because language is always evolving and moving and people try to use it in slightly different ways, you know, you know, because that way they can grab your attention. That way they can say something that's a bit more original. And so that's why it happens that way. You'll see a headline that says, and, and this is a dumb example, but let's say they come up with a law that says you're not allowed to bring your cat out in the rain, right? In some neighborhood or some place. And so the headline will say something from now on, it's only raining dogs. And then they'll, they'll talk about it. And at the end it'll say, so from now on, since no cats are going outside, it won't be raining cats and dogs anymore, but it'll only be raining dogs, something like that. Anyway, everyone's going to understand what it means, despite it being kind of a dumb head, dumb play on words. But anyway, everyone's going to understand the play on words. That's the important thing. However, an algorithm, not necessarily. It's going to translate it as it's only raining dogs from now on. And which means nothing in pretty much any other language I know of. Um, and there are other variations of this. One is that very often we, we get them wrong. The, the other day I was having a conversation and this one guy was talking about someone. He's like, blah, blah, blah. And he's too smart for his britches anyway. And blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the conversation went on because everyone understood what he was trying to say. He's like, um, you know, he's too smart for his britches. It, it was fine and it was clear, except it's wrong. That's not what the expression is. It's supposed to be he's too big for his britches, right? And uh, so there again, an algorithm it won't get that right. It, it'll just translate it literally and it won't make any sense. Um, so, and, and uh, just another example, recently I was reading an article and it talked about an Occamite, um, what did it say? Anyway, it said it was a rather Occamite situation. Now, it happened that two paragraphs earlier, it referenced Occam's razor. And it said, you need to refer to Occam's razor in these situations, blah, blah, blah. And then two paragraphs later, it says, and this is somewhat Occamite. So obviously Occamite, which is not a real word, by the way, I looked it up before doing this. Occamite was referring to Occam's razor. Now, it's perfectly fine to use it this way. Obviously he invented the word, if you will, and just wanted to say Occamite to refer to Occam's razor. And anyone reading it will get it. I, you know, I understood it fine because it referred to Occam's razor right before. So it, in fact, it only stuck with me because I had this video in my mind. And so, you know, it clicked and, and that's why it, it stuck with me. But otherwise most native speakers won't even pay attention to that. But once again, the algorithm won't know that word because it's not a real word. And so it won't compute if you will. Um, and there's so many other examples, uh, obviously, and you see this a lot also with uh, simple, with nursery rhymes, obviously with any type of poem, with any type of song lyrics and, and stuff like that. Uh, recently I was reading about how the cat on the mat, if you enter that in Google Translate, it gets translated literally, but it's one of the first phrases any English speaker learns and it sticks because it rhymes. That's why you learn it. It's one of those things, the cat on the mat. Um, but, and every language has its own equivalent, but it's not literally the cat on the mat. Anyway, fine. So let's say, okay, we understand how all these sort of euphemisms, metaphors, similes, you know, innuendos, these, these, uh, these expressions that have been, that have entered our vocabulary, it's a bit harder to use them with uh, Google Translate or with any sort of machine translation. So, okay, fine. But aside from that, you might think machine translation follows a certain, um, algorithm and it's a very complicated algorithm and getting smarter every day. So stuff that's more mathematical in language can probably be translated, right? So here I'm talking about technical texts. I'm talking about financial texts, legal texts, stuff like that. Um, except here you get into other issues. Now, all these issues are pretty advanced. Uh, anyone who's used Google translate for more than a couple sentences. In fact, you can go pick any paragraph in whatever language and translate it back to your native or whatever your you're more comfortable with and read it through and you'll notice some glaring mistakes. So Google still has to go through those, you know, before it starts actually tackling all of these. But anyway, once it gets through those, it has, as I mentioned before, all these expressions that it's going to have to deal with. And the expressions are constantly changing by the way and evolving. So that makes it harder as well. Also, uh, when it comes to these more mathematical texts, there are a lot of other issues to deal with as well. So I've seen, because I deal with a lot of legal translations, uh, in this legalese, I see a lot of issues with a double negative. English does not have double negative. You don't say you don't know nothing. You say you don't know anything because two negatives make a positive. That's the feeling, but this is quite artificial because actually they, 
they tried to do this on purpose back at, during the Age of Enlightenment or something is when they decided that that should be the rule in English. And most other languages, definitely Western European, they don't have that. Uh, so, you know, you don't know anything in, uh, in French, tu ne sais pas rien. In Italian, tu non sais niente. In uh, Spanish, uh, tu non sabes nada. So, I mean, all of these would be double negative in all these languages. And so you just put tu non sais niente and you translate into English. Probably most of these machine translations will figure it out because it's not that hard. And I mean, once you do it, once it's been seen a couple times in past translations, it can get that part. However, what I see in these legal translations are extremely weird, convoluted sentences. You know, these lawyers trying to make them as convoluted as possible so you can't understand them. So you need to hire more lawyers and keep paying them to figure them out. I mean, you know, that's what they say. But uh, so, okay, here's a sentence that I had just recently, uh, if I can find it here. Should the client here and after refer to inter alia the principal not have any indemnification with regards to or against any and all actions, proceedings, claims, or anyway, it, you know, it's a sentence that no normal person would say. And in there you have, I mean, not a double negative, but you have something that would be double negative in most other languages. Um, so this can be very dangerous. And I have seen this in the past where if you try to use a machine translation, it, uh, it brings it out as two negatives because many times one of the negatives is here and the other one is here. And so it'll bring them out as two negatives, which means not only you have a mistake in translation, but you end up saying the complete opposite of what you want to say. If you want to say you're forbidden to do this, in actuality, you'll end up saying you're not forbidden to do this, which can be very dangerous with a contract or legal, you know, any legal document. So that's something you need to be careful about. Another thing that you have with legal translations, with uh, financial stuff, accounting especially, and whatnot, is that in different countries, they are very, very different. So if I have a text, if I have a text that's describing how things are in the States and they refer to, you know, miles, uh, that's a simple way to put it, miles or degrees Fahrenheit or about certain legal issues or accounting standards or financial standards or something along those lines, then fine. You can translate it, translate it correctly, and then you're fine. But if you're trying to write, say, a contract that's valid here and in another country, Bolivia, China, Australia, wherever it might be, then you can't just do that. You need to convert it and you need to make sure it makes sense in, well, in Celsius or kilometers or in the legal, uh, in, you know, for the laws of whatever country you're dealing with or for the accounting standards of whatever country or area you're dealing with. Um, because there are many different accounting standards, financial standards, um, legal standards. I did a video earlier about the different way you can write numbers and that's digits in all these, in, in Switzerland, in Italy, in the US, they're all different in, in China. It's very different. And, um, you know, and these are just with numbers. So when it comes to actually writing things out, things can be very different according to different laws and accounting standards, et cetera, et cetera. Google Translate doesn't know this. Any of me, these machine translations don't know this. By the way, many bilingual people don't know this. This is why you can't just hire someone who's bilingual to do these translations. You need to hire someone who knows what they're doing. So um, that's Anyway, so that's one of the issues, one of the big issues that you see and that you can come up across when you're dealing with all these, uh, you know, legal, more technical texts, let's say, financial, legal, stuff like that. Also remember, a lot of money is on the line for these, and so they take them very seriously, these, uh, a lot of these translations. Basically, what I'm driving at is that Google Translate is an algorithm. And another argument I've heard is that, well, okay, Google has been so good at doing things like driverless cars you know, they can definitely do translation. And I'm, I might catch, catch some flack for this, but I mean, you, driverless cars in a way is almost easier than translation because you're not dealing with the way humans speak. Driverless car, in essence, I know it's a lot more complicated than this, but basically you want to keep the person safe. So you're like, get from A to B and avoid any obstacle that's in the way, right? And so that is an algorithm. I mean, that's it's a very complicated one that I could never come up with. And, and obviously it needs to be tweaked and it's getting better and better all the time, but you're basically avoiding the obstacles and trying to get from A to B safely in one piece. But language translation is not just that algorithm. It is that judgment call. It's that, it's that uh, innate understanding that we need to have. And I don't want to sound like, oh, we humans are so artistic that the machines can't capture it because machines can capture a whole lot, but it's that judgment call 
where you get the gist of the situation, everything that's happened, that's very difficult. Just as it is now, Google Translate translates sentence to sentence and almost all, in fact, all the machine translations I've seen do that. At maximum, they'll refer to a sentence right before. But anything that's two paragraphs before, like the Occam's Razor uh, example I made before, um, you know, they're not going to catch that because there's too much other information in the middle and, you know, it's not sure should we refer to that or should we refer to something else. So, I mean, it's, uh, anyway, it can, it can be an issue that it needs to be, it's not an issue of making the algorithm better or smarter. It's an issue of getting a whole new algorithm, a whole new type of AI, if you will. Um, and that is an issue. And I think until they come up with this new type of AI, that they won't be able to substitute real translators. Here, let me give an example. I think I've mentioned this example before, but it's a very good example of this precisely. And I got it from Steve Pinker, by the way. There's an expression that if I'm speaking to another native speaker, they'll have no problem understanding. I'll say something like, oh, you know, time flies like the wind. And they'll be like, yep, it sure does. Everyone understands that and it's fine. And you move on with the conversation, right? And you're reminiscing, you'll be like, oh, time flies like the wind. And that's fine. Okay, and you think, okay, what's well, that's not very hard in terms of uh, in terms of an expression. However, there are many different ways that an algorithm could read that. Time flies like the wind. Well, uh, there's a joke that says time flies like the wind, fruit flies like bananas, and that could be a way to read it. Time flies could be a type of fly, and they like the wind, and uh, fruit flies like bananas, and so time flies like the wind. So that could be another way to translate it. Here's another way. Time flies, here's a stopwatch. Time flies like the wind, okay? So the wind is going, and then you have flies going. Time them, I guess in relation to the wind or something like that, right? Um, and here's yet another way to see it, a fourth way. You can say, I'm giving you a stopwatch. I'm giving the wind a stopwatch. You time flies like the wind times flies. Time flies like the wind. Now, any English speaker is, good, is, is listening to this and saying, okay, but those are stupid. No one thinks that way. No, but they're grammatically 100% correct. So any algorithm is going to see them that way. Any algorithm, you know, is, is that's the issue with any algorithm, let's say. And so for this specific example, maybe, you, you know, it can figure it out because it's a pretty common one, but it's just an example of something we as humans don't think about because we can make that judgment call right away. But computers with their algorithms do have to process it and they have to make sense of it and very often that can be hard, especially when someone's giving their new take on, uh, on an expression um, and uh, time flies like the wind. It can be time flies like an arrow, time flies, you know, like anything else. Or it can be, or the days fly like the wind or, I mean, you know, you're going to find different variations thereof or when they just get it wrong. Like the example I mentioned of someone who's too smart for their britches, um, but then carries on the conversation as if nothing happened because everyone figured it out. So it's fine. So anyway, that's just my argument, if you will, against trying to use this machine translation willy-nilly, trying to use Google Translate willy-nilly. There's another expression, willy-nilly. In fact, you know, yeah, try to enter that, see if that translates into whatever language, because you understood what I meant. Even if you don't know the expression willy-nilly, you got the gist of what I was saying. But willy-nilly isn't the most common expression. I guess it is, kind of is. Anyway, you know, try it with machine translation, see what happens. But Here's what I want to get into. I'm not actually against machine translation. I am against people thinking it will take over, you know, or drop, or people thinking they can use that instead of translation. I'm not against it. I think actually it's very important. And there's certain situations in which it's very useful. One is, one is when there are emergencies. You take, if there's a famine or a war or a disaster in some place like Syria or Haiti or whatever it might be, and you need to, you, you know, you need to communicate in a different language with someone and you need to ask for water, for supplies, for blankets, stuff like that. And you list them out. Of course, use Google Translate because you're not going to use euphemisms. You're not going to use kind of weird innuendos or new expressions or whatever it might be. No, you're just going to list things that you need. And then, and the person receiving it, by the way, will understand, like, even if the translation is a bit off, they'll figure out what you mean. You say you need bags. Bags could mean bags under your eyes in English, and maybe they receive the wrong translation of bags under your eyes, but they'll realize, oh no, it must mean bags because it's, uh, anyway. So when you have, when you have an emergency, of course you use it. You're not going to try to wait for, 
someone to do the correct translation or anything like that because time is of the essence. The other situation in which I think it's used correctly and well um, and very useful is when people who know what they're doing are using it. People who know the ins and outs of the translation, the mistakes that can be made, especially the mistakes with machine translation, then it can be very useful. And these experts, by the way, are translators. And so someone like me, I do a lot of translations in financial and legal, in the financial and legal fields in Italian. So I'll use websites like Lingue um, and, uh, and uh, what else is there? There's Reverso, stuff like that. They operate under the same idea. They scour other texts and see how things have been translated in the past. But there, uh, at least as far as I know, what they do is they scour other financial or EU government, you know, official texts that can be. So these are official ones that you can count on and you can refer back to. So usually you don't translate whole paragraphs. Obviously, you just translate a word or an expression and uh, and then it'll show the original and the translation that was issued by the EU or by whatever bank or something like that. So if there are issues, you can refer back to it and, or you can pick and choose. You can say, well, I'll choose the official government one and not the bank one because I want to use the official government translation. Anyway, for people who know what they're doing, this can be a great help. So a lot of people say they don't want to use, you know, in fact, people boast it, say I use no machine translation at all. And I'm like, well, why not? It's, it's a help. You know, if you know what you're doing, it can be a tremendous help. It can be very dangerous for someone who has no idea what they're doing and just figures they can enter something and just use that as a translation. And so that's kind of what I'm against. So, uh, yeah. How long have I been speaking? Quite a long time, haven't I? Okay, anyway, I'll wind it all up. So hopefully this makes sense to you. Hopefully here you grasp, you have a better grasp and idea of how translations work and how basically machine translation is still behind and i don't think we'll get up to that level even if they perfect the algorithm because it needs a completely different algorithm one that has a sort of judgment call that captures the quote-unquote gist of the situation which we humans do innately but machines thus far cannot do uh, they can fake it pretty well but they can't do it because they don't you know they, they think in terms of algorithms and in terms of programming and not in terms of judgment calls like we do uh, which means they're very, very good at some things that we can never hope to be as good at, as them at. But for other things, we still have that advantage. Um, anyway, so I hope you found this useful. And uh, yeah, I hope you can refer to this, especially at least some of these arguments, especially when people start asking, oh, is translation uh, is a field that's uh, not going to exist anymore? Or is it, uh, you know, is, is, is it going to die out or something like that? And the reason, and actually I don't mind people saying it that much because I feel like the more people feel that way, the fewer people will enter the translation world. And you know, that's less competition, if you will. So if, if they want to think that way, then that's fine. On the other hand, if they think that way, then they're gonna start using Google Translate instead of a translator, and that's gonna be bad for them. So, you know, we'll see. Anyway, that's it for now. I hope you found this useful. Hope you appreciated the suit. And I'll talk to you in the next video. Thanks, bye. Oh, and also don't forget to subscribe if you want more videos like this. Don't forget to click the like button if you do find this useful because then I can know what's useful and what isn't. It gives me a better idea. And yeah, that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.